Get back to your desks, Professor Einstein is almost here, shouted Feynman, the class monitor. In a matter of seconds, what could have been declared as a chaotic system of loitering chatterboxes was organized into a class of physics students eagerly waiting for the arrival of their professor. Einstein walks in. Walks up to Planck and slaps him right on his face. The entire class stares in disbelief. After two minutes of trying to control the sob, Planck asks, Professor. Inaudible sob, I was sitting still in my place, just as you had ordered earlier. Einstein retreated, No you were not, pin drop silence in class, at least not from my frame of reference. You were moving relative to me as I walked into the class. The first lesson of the day was taught. The concept of rest and motion was relative. Being humans, the fact that a person can be taller than someone and shorter than someone else at the same time is totally acceptable. We comfortably define the comparative degree of adjectives to be relative to the observer. Similarly, said Einstein later in the lecture, your speed is not absolute and is relative to the frame of reference of the observer. You can never say, I was sitting still in my place unless you mention relative to the classroom floor. The class was startled. They knew they could never again ride the bike at 80 kmph, they could only ride the bike at 80 kmph relative to the ground. If you think about it for a second, you will realize that the speed of yours is not special. In fact, you can be traveling at any speed depending on how fast the observer is moving. Hence, the laws of physics should not be dependent upon your speed. That is why, when I published my special theory of relativity, I proposed the first postulate to be, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames of reference. Sir, what is an inertial frame of reference? Asked Tesla from the fourth bench. It is a body, which does not experience any net force and hence does not accelerate relative to another such inertial system. Like a bus moving with constant velocity with respect to ground. Such a body or system is always at rest or moving with constant velocity with respect to another such body. But sir, what if it does accelerate? Pointed out Edison from the last bench. Einstein smiled and answered, that took me 10 years to determine, we will discuss about it when I teach general theory of relativity, presently the topic is special theory of relativity. As I was saying, if the laws of physics are same for every inertial frame then, when you are standing on the ground and your friend is traveling in a completely enclosed car at a constant velocity with respect to you, and both of you do an experiment like swinging a pendulum, then the two of you will have a hard time agreeing who exactly is in motion, pertaining to the fact that motion is relative. What this means is that there exists no experiment known to mankind which can differentiate in between absolute rest and uniform motion. Planck suddenly felt the pain on his cheeks disappear, as a beautiful scientific explanation can often obliterate your discomforts. Our world would have been a merry place, had I not proposed the second postulate. Did you, Professor? Interrupted Curie. You bet, I did. And it was the second postulate which was the reason why the world's most brilliant scientists failed to grasp the concept for about half the century. Honestly, teaching relativity would have been much easier if the students were toddlers, yet to form the concrete interpretation of the world around them, than, if they were high school goers with their mentality already shaped by the apparent observations and absolutist mindset. But then again, isn't that the case with every idea to be taught? Winked the professor. My second postulate says, the speed of light in vacuum has the same value c in all inertial frames of reference. This was the main reason I troubled myself to come up with the entire theory as it explains a strange observation made by Mitchelson and Morley back in 1887. Although their intention was to investigate the existence of ether, they in turn observed something rather strange. The speed of light seemed to be constant. Should you measure it from a bus moving at 50 kmph or even when you are sipping coffee at rest on your desk? This had no explanation. We all know a bus moving at 50 kmph with respect to ground is moving at the speed of 25 kmph with respect to a car, which in turn is moving at 25 kmph with respect to ground. Even if you were in an aeroplane traveling at 200,000 kmps, with respect to ground you would still observe light to be traveling at 300,000 kmps, which was the same speed observed when you were at rest on the ground. Light, it seemed, was adamant and would only travel at 299,792.458 kmps, which is rounded up to 3 times 10 to the power of 5 kmps and denoted as c by lazy people. The speed of light, unlike speed of any other object is, wait for it, absolute. This spelled disaster for science. 
hundreds of years old kinematics, developed by Galileo and nurtured by Newton was jeopardized. Scientists could point out paradox after paradox resulting due to the Mitchelson-Morley experiment, which could no longer be explained by classical physics. For example, if the speed of light is constant to any observer, then what if someone travels faster than light? Will light still travel at sea for him? What if light is emitted from a moving, from now on when I say moving slash at rest I will mean, moving slash at rest with respect to ground, vehicle? Won't the speed of vehicle add up to speed of light? Sir, if I emit a light pulse from the center of a uniformly moving rocket, I will see the light wave strike both the front and back of the rocket at the same time. But my friend, standing still on ground will observe the light hit the back first, as the back has already moved closer and the front away. Clearly, our observations will not agree. Said Gamo. Well spotted, indeed, you made the list of paradoxes longer, simultaneity now seems to be lost. In other words, No two events could any longer be said to have happened at the same time. As if laws of motion were not enough, the constancy of speed of light messed up the definition of time itself. Clearly, we could have discarded the experiment, but no one could question the authenticity of the carefully conducted Mitchelson-Morley experiment and hence the physicists were faced with two choices, either stay blind or come up with a new theory. And that is what I did. All the students clapped simultaneously, or did they? We grow up thinking that space and time is absolute. We think if the college is one kilometer from home, it will be at the same distance tomorrow, and even the day after or a year later. Similarly, an hour-long length of time is equally long be it in 2017 BC or 2017 AD. But guess what, it is not. Dimensions of space and time, like the speed of ordinary objects, and unlike speed of light is relative. This time the entire class was slapped, verbally. Everything they knew about reality to be absolute seemed to be relative. Logic is simple, but the consequences are a bit, well, weird. He walked up to the board and started writing and speaking simultaneously. Speed is distance over time. As speed increases, distance increases and time decreases. It is not just the magnitude of the distance of time that alters but also the perception of it. A meter seems to be longer and a second shorter but a meter and second are quantities defined by us not by nature. Hence, to ensure that a meter seem longer and second seem shorter, at high speeds, our space contracts, in the direction of motion, and time dilates. Students were heard groaning and struggling to interpret what they had just heard. Professor turned for a second and rephrased what he had just said, it means, the faster you move, the shorter your car gets and slower your clock gets. The only reason you are finding it hard to believe is because, you have never experienced it, since the speed of light is extremely, extremely, extremely fast, we never reach such a speed in daily life and never suffer from any appreciable length contraction or time dilation. But sir, do you have any real life example? Inquired Fermi. You know that every subatomic particle has a definite half-life. But when they are accelerated in LHC to approximately the speed of light, they exist longer, why? because time was slowed down for them. Now imagine you are in a rocket that can accelerate to great speeds. You are planning to break the light barrier and travel faster than light and see what are the effects, purely for academic purposes. When you start the rocket, the velocity increases with the burning of fuel. The more you burn, the faster you go. You'll observe that initially burning a given amount of fuel sped you up immensely, but as time progresses, you will somehow find that the rocket is no more accelerating as much as if the rocket has grown heavier, in other words, your inertia has increased. With the same exact force as earlier, the acceleration turns out be minimal now. There will come a point when you no longer feel like you are accelerating, the more you accelerate by a little bit, the more difficult it gets to accelerate further. If you take my advice, do not look outside the window, for what lays beyond your accelerating rocket can pretty much end you up in a stellar rehab for mentally ill people. You try harder and harder to accelerate further but to no avail. It will seem to you that there exists a speed limit in our universe, limit here being a mathematical limit. You can get closer forever but you can never overtake it. That speed my friends, is c, and if you observe your speedometer you will be astonished to find out that you indeed are failing to cross that speed limit despite using a lot of energy. Your friend however, is on earth and observing you with a telescope. For him, or her, the scenario will be entirely different. He will see you accelerate initially, and as you gain speed, he will observe that the rocket you are traveling in growing shorter, 
until it appears to be only like a disc. What your friend is observing is actually, length contraction. If you two were communicating by some method, then initially both of you would be pinging each other alternately at equal intervals, then slowly your friend will start to observe that your pings are coming at greater intervals. You will observe that your friend has gone crazy and is pinging you continuously with progressively diminishing intervals. It's not that you are becoming lazy, or your friend hyperactive, it is just that time is slowing down for you unlike your friend. This is time dilation. What we learn from here is that, to make sense of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment, you will need to accept the laws that I have formulated, and a consequence of those laws is that a speed barrier is created. No one can claim firmly that theory of relativity is damn correct but the reason it is so widely believed is because it explains the observations better than other competent theories, not that there are many. It is difficult for anyone to convince you whether relativity is correct because it deals with scenarios which are not observed in daily lives but nevertheless, effects of relativity though minute are omnipresent in our daily lives. Which means if you travel more in a car you live longer than if you walk, by maybe a nanosecond. Sir, you said our mass increases. How is that even possible? Asked Hawking. Mass increases by the same factor as length decreases and time slows, the increase of mass is what prevents you from crossing the light barrier. As mass is inversely proportional to acceleration when a constant force is acting, the more energy you put into the rocket, it all adds up to the mass of it rather than increasing the speed. That way energy seems to be proportional to mass. Oh yeah, and the constant of proportionality is the square of speed of light. E equals mc squared. Professor dropped the mic, though he did not have any. Some students felt the atom bomb drop. Finally, they have learned how that little, elegant, devilishly popular formula fit into the entirety of special theory of relativity. Einstein was done with the lesson, he was starting to move out of the classroom, or as he might say the classroom was starting to move behind with respect to him, right when Dirac asked, Professor, what about general relativity? Einstein stopped, and without turning back, said, Ever been in an accelerating rocket in space? You will feel like gravity is acting backwards though there isn't any gravity. Ever been in a freely falling lift on the earth? You will feel like there is no gravity even though there is indeed. Acceleration and gravity are indistinguishable in a closed system. That's it? Nope, that's the beginning, and the end says, dramatic pause, space and time are curved and could be warped. He left. The class did not want to believe what they had just heard, but they were in a dilemma, for Professor Einstein had his ways to make them believe. They sat still in their places with respect to the ground. After the lecture on relativity, the class of physics students had somehow forgotten to revert back into the chaotic system of loitering chatterboxes. P.S. The names of the students have been taken from the surnames of popular scientists, kindly do not mistakenly identify them as the real scientists, as they are just students in the class Professor Einstein teaches. This lecture is considered to have been given in the recent times by Professor Einstein, who has been assumed to be a teacher of physics for a group of physics students. Also there are no images and approximately no equations in the post as I deliberately wanted the words to do the talking. Kindly share this with everyone. Professor Einstein will be happy. BTW, this post was written in July 2017. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay. Connect on LinkedIn. Mail me. It's the year 3069, you are an astronaut. You're fed up of earthly life and decide to shoot off into deep space in your brand new Teslax Model V, which is equipped with the 42nd Gen Merlin engines and is capable of an interplanetary flight with a range of 200 light minutes. After a week of travel, you land your Teslax on Triton, Neptune's largest moon. Having landed there you realize that about 10 other humans had silently hitchhiked the ride. Now you gotta kickstart your life on this planet. In this post, we'll accompany your civilization from its infancy to maturity and explore its economics. We'll see how your civilization begins trade, adopts diamonds as its currency, starts using bills backed by diamond, switches to a fiat currency and eventually accepts cryptocurrencies as the standard. In case you feel that this journey is a bit too much reminiscent of what happened here on Earth, well, I won't deny, that's true and kind of like the whole point. It would have been boring to just point out what happened before. Instead, following a story as it develops would be worthwhile, especially so, since you're the protagonist. Level 1, Enter the Triton As soon as you land, 
one of those hitchhikers pulls out a banana and starts consuming the most consumed fruit of your ex-planet. You realize that dude has another one hanging, a real banana, don't think otherwise. You ask him to share it with you. He says he will, if you would give him your cap, which says hashtag Triton forever. The two of you exchange and now you have something to eat and dude has something to show off. You just engaged in a simple trade where the two parties possessed exactly what the other required. A barter exchange, therefore, was enough to satisfy your needs. Such exchanges continued. At times you exchanged your sunglasses for a Snickers while at other times your Teslax key for the right to enjoy your night with another hitchhiker. This other hitchhiker was a great storyteller and therefore you subscribed to her services by paying your Teslax key as a fee. If what I learned is true, she probably narrated an Edgar Allan Poe story and you were very satisfied. One fine day this companion of yours returned from a short trip to the nearby Neptune with your Teslax. She brought back diamonds. Turns out, atmospheric pressures can soar so high in Neptune that it often rains diamonds. This was great news. Level 2 Finding the gem. Lately, there have been some problems with your Triton settlement. What was initially a group of 11 hitchhikers has now expanded into a civilization of 1,000 or so humans thanks to the gift of reproduction. With the population, cometh the demands. While some humans specialized in farming, others specialized in constructions. This meant a part of the society had more food than they could eat and others could build more houses than they'll need. They started to sell their products and services among each other. This often posed a problem. You may require food but the people who sell food don't need a house, exactly what you had to offer in return. At times they tried exchanging something else for food, but this something else was extremely variable and none of the parties felt that exchanging it was fair trade. When diamonds were introduced in your society, these solved this problem. Now you could exchange diamonds in return for food, services or other stuff. The reason diamonds were a good candidate was because they were rare, no one could simply procure diamonds, they needed to use the Teslax to collect some from Neptune but the present owner of the vehicle barely leased it. This meant the number of diamonds in the society was more or less constant with a small upward trend as time progressed. Diamonds were indestructible and were not perishable. If you were frugal enough, you can hold your diamond wealth for generations without it decaying. However, diamonds had almost no intrinsic value. You can't live in them nor eat them, but they look good and was a metaphor for prestige and wealth. With all these properties, diamonds soon became an abstract measure of wealth that could be exchanged whenever two parties traded anything. But there was a problem. Thieves started to torment the civilization. It was hard to hide hard diamonds in your pockets. Anybody would know that this dude here is carrying currencies and launch an attack. Also, over time as more diamonds were mined, collected, and entered circulation, the prices started to inflate. One diamond used to fetch two nights of storytelling. Now it fetches just a few hours. Level 3, Making the Notes The government, and yes, there's one, and you're let's say, what would you like to be, the president? Okay, you're the president of Triton. Congrats, decided to issue currency bills and quite, unoriginally called then dollars. These dollars solve two problems. You no longer had to carry 1,000 diamonds to buy a T-Phone 12 Pro. You just needed a note, or bill, that was issued by the government and had the value of $1,000, $1 equals 1 diamond. All the diamonds were locked up behind safety lockers. You, therefore, have two layers of abstraction in every trade you make. First diamonds abstract the wealth and now dollars abstracted diamonds. BTW if you're wondering how the hell you're still alive as we're at least 500 years into the future from 3069, well maybe you had taken some elixir. There were some issues with counterfeit notes and notes getting torn, but the government, headed by you, handled it with grace. Soon the society, now about a million members big, developed a trust on the government. Your gov had a legislature that made laws, a judiciary that enforced it and an executive body that gave speeches. Level 4 Trusting the trust. One fine day your government announces that one dollar would no longer mean one diamond. The economy was now fairly large and the government fairly powerful. It said with confidence that all Triton inhabitants should trust the government that each dollar is worth a dollar. In case someone says it's not worth a dollar, Gov would send troops, arrest the dude, and fine him one hundred dollars. People say that's fine. And fine it was. 
by now Triton had a billion inhabitants, quite densely populated as you might realize. It was divided into multiple countries. Each country had a government. You were now the president of the strongest one and when your country announced the introduction of a fiat currency, everyone else followed suit albeit with some dissatisfaction. Now the currency was as strong as the economy. If for some reason there was a war and the government was destroyed, there would be no one to enforce the currency. Gone are the days where dollars were backed by tangible diamonds. All that there was now was trust. If there was trust, there was value in the currency. Trust therefore became the primary currency. Problem was however that some people had more control over this trust than others. As a result, corruption was commonplace. You avoided it, but some people in your administration were knee-deep into it. Bankers, wealthy people and government officials often made monetary policies that favored themselves. This made the currencies across the Triton volatile. Poor Tritonians would at times dip below poverty as the dollars, or whatever currency their Tritonian country had, they owned often lost their value due to inflation. Level 5, One for All and All for One The last nail in the coffin came during the year of 4069, exactly 1000 years after you had landed. Yes, you are still alive but tell me how come 11 people gave rise to a 1.1 billion just 1,000 years later? Damn, y'all really fertile. Your government started to ease up regulations on the big banks in the country. They found the freedom to give away loans and sell the debt to insurance companies. These big insurance firms were now insuring really bad deals which were almost bound to fail. Soon everyone realized that although they were rich on paper, the money they thought they owned didn't really exist. Suddenly, People started to accumulate their wealth from all sources to battle the upcoming recession. Money was pulled out of banks, investments stopped and the economy stalled. Poor Tritonians lost the savings of their lives as the stock market crashed and banks were declared bankrupt. All this just because the people had blindly trusted the government. But it seemed that their trust was betrayed. This sparked off a revolution. Some individuals realized that trusting the big banks was no more an option. They wanted to trust nothing but logic. And maths is the language of logic. Therefore, up came Bitcoin, another, unoriginally named cryptocurrency that was backed by pure mathematical rigor. You see, there are two ways to keep track of wealth. You can do that in deductive terms where every individual has a net worth. Assets are added and liabilities are subtracted. Or you can keep track of all the transactions by pairing earnings with spendings. The former was utilized until now. Dollars were the representatives of your net worth. The latter was used in this cryptocurrency. Here a ledger replaced the dollar. This ledger contained records of every transaction ever made. The program that ran and conducted transactions was visible to everyone yet the logic was immutable and universal. No longer would the individuals have to trust a bank or a government for their currencies. This new system was superior in that every node in the network had an equal say for every decision in the algorithm. Therefore such a currency became backed by computational power and electric supply. Trust was replaced with logic. The power of probability succeeded age-old trust. Coins were now just an abstraction over the transactions which were in the heart of the currency. Now, that's all I know about. I don't know whether this currency would be suitable for the long term. But for now, at least in Triton, it is what it is. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay Connect on LinkedIn Mail me, when I was three, 99 was the biggest number I knew of. One day I was reciting the numbers at the playground, and stopped at 99 with an air of finality. This other dude said, and 100, and then continued with 101, 102, etc. This felt weird. He was wandering in uncharted territory, yet the numbers could be constructed with what I already knew. All I needed was the magic word 100 or whatever he said. After 199, I was expecting him to stop but this wizard went on with 200, 200, and 1, etc. This felt weirder. Not immediately, but sometime later when I was ruminating over multiplying and adding numbers I already knew with 100. To have a number as big as 9999 was breathtaking. Now, this is not entirely true. Some of it is, like the counting and playground part. Rest is fiction that's fabricated to serve as a good introduction to, wait for it, Googleology the study of big numbers. If you think we'll end this article with giants like Googleplex or Graham's number, oh boy did you underestimate the size of significant large numbers. 
things are going to get pretty big, pretty soon. Starting from the bottom. Zero is the number with the smallest absolute value. Next natural number is one, which by the way, is infinite times bigger than zero. In between the two of these, the additive identity and the multiplicative identity respectively, are some cool really small ones. Take Google Plexi and Minex for example, which is 0.000000001 with Google Duplex 1 zeros after the decimal. Google Duplex is like Google Plex which is one followed by Google zeros, but has one followed by Google Plex zeros, and Google is our plain old friend with one followed by a hundred zeros. To get an idea of how small this number is, let's try to get an idea of a Google. Google isn't hard to write. If you Google Google, Google displays Google immediately in the first page itself. Let's say inflation-adjusted richest man ever, $400 billion worth Mansa Musa, donates each of his bucks to one human being. Although we're going beyond the scope of reproductive potential of our species with this example, we'll pretend that's not a problem, for now. Each human being now hands over all the microorganisms inhabiting their gut microbiome to King Musa. This way he'll go broke but have 100 trillion times 400 hundred billion microbe to work with. Remember how Google had one followed 100 zeros? Musa now has four followed by 24 zeros number of microbes. If each of these travel to the edge of the universe and back and then repeat that every second as many times as the age of universe and seconds, and manage to add up their odometers, we'll be looking at, 4 times 10 to the power of 24 x 8 times 10 to the power of 26 x 4 times 10 to the power of 17 meters. A hefty 10 to the power of 72 meters. That's a lot of travel, even though we're technically breaking the barrier of speed of light every second. Mind you, 10 to the power of 72 is not 72% of Google, but rather 0.000001% with 25 zeros. Ha, huh, we left on a mission to study big numbers. We're still in between 0 and 1, trying to make sense of Google Plexi and the next. In the process we encountered Google Duplex, then Google Plex, then Google and after epic multiplications, we're still at, 10-25% of it. Therefore, I believe this wouldn't be a nice time to introduce you to a Google Triplex or, as you might reason out, a number with one followed by a Google Duplex of zeros. How to Grow? This particular question gets thrown around a lot over the internet, mostly in banner ads and shady sites. But, we're asking a specific question. How to grow a number? Rephrasing, what are some functions that yield large numbers? If you count from 1 to 10, with each number a second, it takes you 10 seconds, duh. Counting to 100 takes 100 seconds or about 2 minutes, although in reality it would take more as bigger numbers contain more syllables. In a utopian world, however, Counting to 1000 will take a bit more than quarter of an hour with one number a second. A million shall take about one and half week. A billion will take 31 years and a trillion will, well, it'll take 317 centuries, but I'm having a gut feeling that you'll be facing a time constraint here. So, now let's start counting every millisecond. Or what if we go down to micro, or nano, or pico, or femto, or auto, or zepto, or yocto? Yeah. Counting in yoctosecond sounds cool, because this way you'll be able to count a trillion in a picosecond, a quadrillion in a nanosecond, a quintillion in a microsecond, sextillion in millis, septillions in seconds and then skipping over octillions, nonillions, decillions and settling with an undecillion in 317 centuries. Not a bad deal if you ask me. This way of counting one number after the other is very linear. Even when we try to jump from a number a second to a number in a millisec, it's still exponential at best. In the field of Googleology, exponentiation is being cheap. We need tetrations and pentations and only then will our life be merry. Segue to Graham's number. You repeat addition to multiply, repeat multiplication to exponentiate, so we'll repeat exponentiation to tetrate. Exponentials grow quickly, but tetrations are even quicker. Knuth's arrow notation comes in particularly handy at this moment. A arrow b is defined as simple exponentiation. A double arrow b is therefore tetration. It means, a raised to a b number of times or a to the power of a to the power of a a to the power of a to the power of a, b times. Triple arrow starts to make us go crazy. 
2 arrow 4 is just 16, 2 double arrow 4 becomes a tower of 2s with 4 2s in tower or 2 squared 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 which is, 65,536. 2 triple arrow 4 is just a tower of 2 with 2 double arrow 2s. That is, 2 squared squared, 2 squared squared with 65,536 times. Playing the same game with 3s, we get 3 arrow 3 is 27, 3 double arrow 3 is 9.6 trillion, and 3 triple arrow 3 as well, it's big. But we don't care, let's instead name 3 quadruple arrow 3 as G1. Then G2 becomes 3 arrow arrow, arrow arrow 3 with G1 arrows, G3 becomes 3 arrow arrow, arrow arrow 3 with G2 arrows and so on. Finally, when we reach, G64 or G, we stop and call it the Graham's number. Why though? The reason Graham's number is famous and not Graham's number plus one or something is because this particular number solves a problem in combinatorics. The universe is considered to have a volume of 10 to the power of 80 meter cubes and the smallest possible unit volume, Planck volume equals 10 minus 105. Fitting one digit in each and each Planck volume of the universe does no justice to Graham's number. In fact, fitting Google duplex digits to each Planck volume of Google triplex universes, multiverse? Still falls miraculously short of the goddamn Graham's number. The only way to make yourself forget about Graham's number and calm down is by going crazy with tree 3. Which is so big, so so big, so 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 big, so so so, so so big, with Graham's number of so s, that, well, nothing actually, it's really very big. It props up from a fast-growing function in graph theory. Replace that 3 with 4 or Graham's number and you get an even bigger number. Thinking about this gives me a similar feeling to that time in childhood when I was trying to comprehend 9999, even though, I'm not quite sure whether that really happened. Uncomputables Till now, we were in the domain of computable numbers. This could have been written down like 10 duo trigentillion, Google, if we had enough space. But beyond these exists the domain of uncomputable. These are basically functions which churn out humongous numbers. Busy beaver numbers are a great entry point to this topic. At this time, we are no longer hoping to define numbers as the tag uncomputable mean that these are you know, uncomputable. Some other examples include the largest named numbers in professional mathematics, the Ryon numbers. Others intruding into the list are Bigfoot, Oblivion, Sam's number and finally, Infinity, although it's better to treat infinity as a concept rather than numbers. Infinity We discussed a lot but all these numbers were exactly 0% of infinity. Therefore, the title wasn't a clickbait. Cheers! Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay Connect on LinkedIn Mail me, in every dystopian forecast of the future, AI and robots steal our jobs. Humans first go unemployed. Then a robot marries an AI. They have a cute artificially intelligent robot child. This dude learns how to recreate itself. Creates a thousand copies. Teaches them vital concepts. The definition of machine learning becomes more literal. Now, these 1,000 robots start to control the planet. Humans, on the other hand, go underground and plan a revolution. Although we're not immediately losing our jobs or planning a revolution, it might be beneficial to explore the pros and cons of having AI as doctors and robots as surgeons and ask which one of these two is more realistic and helpful in the bigger picture. AI is doctors. What do doctors do? First, they diagnose. Then they treat. Question is, can AI do this? AI enthusiasts might tell you being a doctor is fundamentally a data science problem. You observe a case and make note of multiple variables and rank them in order of importance. You have been trained to treat multiple instances of particular sets of variables. You browse the memory and extract the most fitting treatment according to the protocols. Can't an AI do the same? You type your primary complaints, it asks you more relevant questions trying to narrow down the possibilities. Then queries database for examinations and investigation to confirm the provisional diagnoses and eliminate the differentials. Reach a conclusion. Prescribe the medicine according to the latest protocol. Done. Given enough data, doesn't seem impossible. It can even function in parallel with doctors, where docs examine and give diagnoses and AI prescribes while trying to avoid side effects. This can markedly speed up healthcare. Pros. No waiting rooms. Boom. 
What do people hate worse than receiving an injection? Waiting patiently in the patient's waiting room. And understandably so. To have patients when you're not well is a difficult task, even Herculean at times. AI is reproducible. It will probably exist in a central server and run at your client's side device. That will save time as consultations can now run in parallel. Healthcare can also reach remote regions. The cost will diminish as well. AI will make healthcare more accessible. It will free up doctors from minor cases and give them time to work upon the more complicated ones. AI and consumer devices will nag you to improve your habits. An iPhone buzzing 20 times a day and asking you to not sit idle and move about is expected to work better than a doctor telling you to do so once every semester when you visit him. The biggest benefit of having AI as a doctor is that now the doctor comes to you rather than you going to the doctor. From the sporadic assessment of health, we move towards continuous evaluation. The whole world becomes a clinic and your phone becomes your family physician. Cons AI systems have been conventionally built to do a particular job but not explain why it did what it did. Today when a doctor makes a wrong decision a committee can be set up and the issue gets diagnosed which might fix a point of potential mistake for future mistakes. This is possible because a doctor can justify his thought process. An AI algorithm doesn't do that, yet. We have models which take x-ray images as input and mark out the areas of deviation from normal. It gives you a percentage of confidence. But what if the disease is rare? How will we get enough examples to train the AI? Also as negative results are more prevalent what if AI learns to say no more often? If more positives are shown, what if it overfits the training sample? These cons are dwarfed by the prospect of replacing the pristine doctor-patient relationship with an app-patient one. It will take a long time for the general public to trust an inanimate healer. There are also concerns with data security but those are not directly related to our present discussion and therefore have been ignored at the moment. Robots as surgeons Human bodies weren't built to endure surgery. That's why surgeons need to train for years to ensure that the benefits of cutting into you outweigh the harm inflicted. Every surgeon takes care of four aspects before beginning a procedure. 1. Anatomy 2. Infection 3. Pain 4. Hemorrhage. Anatomy dictates the type of instruments used and the approach of least side effect. Sterilized OTS and proper wound dressing take care of the infection. Anesthesia and analgesics control the pain. Cauterization and controlled incisions reduce the possibility of hemorrhage. These factors become necessary as performing surgery upon a three-dimensional human being in a space-time continuum with only three spatial dimensions compel the surgeons to reach the organs through the surface rather than around. Pros From the above discussion, you can appreciate that the smaller the incision, the better the situation. Humans have two hands. The requirement of more hands involves more humans that crowd the field of surgery. Our skeletal muscles have units of muscle fibers. We control the number of motor units we want to involve in action and not the intensity directly. At a finer scale, human actions appear rather jerky than continuous. A robotic arm improves this situation by exerting a controlled amount of force with no chances of fluctuations. Robots can also zoom into an area and perform surgery at a greater resolution requiring smaller incisions and no sutures. The advent of nanotechnology can remove the requirement of incisions altogether as entry can occur via mucosal surfaces through absorption. Then these can relocate to the area of interest by hitchhiking through the bloodstream. When the surgery happens in an ot, the surgeon must be in the ot. If the bot does the surgery, the surgeon can control it from his backyard, not recommended but possible. Telemedicine becomes a possibility by introducing a robotic interface between the surgeon and the patient. Cons Cost is a factor. And an important one. Costly equipment means only the urban population has access to it if they are willing to spend a lot. This is a blow to the universalization of healthcare. The learning curve might also be steep for many professionals which can be an issue at the beginning. These robots are not meant to be mobile and localized to the location of their installation. Though surgeons can happily go from one hospital to another, these will stay where they are and require patients to be brought to them. Ultimate Showdown Robots have entered the OT while AI has entered the diagnostic labs. Both are making great progress. Although they are not mutually exclusive, 
The distinction we are trying to have here is between their uses in the OTS and clinics. Clearly both of them would be a boon to both surgeons and doctors. The very nature of these inventions is to simplify the process and adopting them into the workflow, if properly designed, won't bother the health experts much. The probability of error is an important factor. A surgical robot remains in greater control under a surgeon. If the surgeon makes no mistake, the robot by itself will add very little random error. An AI, however, can create situations of false positives and negatives when used in series with a doctor's reasoning. Using it in parallel could minimize this error at the cost of not being as time efficient. To summarize, robots are closer to displacing the surgeons, to the robot's control area or a remote location, than AI is to replacing the doctors. Both AI and robotics have revolutionized in healthcare. In addition, incorporating AI into drug discovery and diagnostics has already reaped benefits and we hope to see more positive effects of technology in the upcoming days. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay. Connect on LinkedIn. Mail me, I absolutely love how YouTube sets the stage for any discussion related to success. There are videos of successful people enumerating what they did to succeed. There are videos of successful YouTubers pointing out what successful people did to succeed. And then there are videos, rather advertisements, of courses that you can take to succeed as it teaches you the successful traits of successful people. Clearly, there isn't a dearth of analysis of success. Entire channels have spun up to fill in the niche of this need to succeed. And now that this niche is overflowing, such content is in fact exponentiating, rather than slowing down, as they need to succeed to quench the need to succeed has left the viewers even thirstier. The last two paragraphs I wrote, are everything that's wrong about what I was trying to voice my opinions against. I used no statistics, no visualizations rather simply generalized observations to arrive at a conclusion. And that conclusion too wasn't a very helpful one. So, let's ditch this attempt to rant about YouTube and instead focus on some concrete statistical ideas. The Objective Every once in a while magic happens and the meaning of mathematical terminology almost coincides with its literary counterpart. This is one such situation. The objective, in normal conversation, refers loosely to your goal and in mathematics is an algebraic expression, often a polynomial, of which, you wish to have the maximum or the minimum value. Coming up with a workable objective is the first step towards success. Waking up every morning and reminding yourself of the objective is the best way to get disciplined and make sure that all your metaphorical engines thrust constructively and propulse you in the desired direction. The quantization. As evident from the last section, to define your objective, you must quantize some parameters. Before diving deep into the endeavor of quantizing qualitative aspects of your life, you might want to spend some time appreciating the role of semi-quantitative scales. You may not require a continuous spectrum with an abstract physical quantity, but you may divvy up the domain into discrete parts if you succeed in finding a criterion to sort with. The constraints. Immortality is a superpower. And superpowers are mostly fictional. Therefore, everyone is mortal. The syllogism employed here is purely for entertainment purposes. In reality, we have limited time. So, whatever be our goal, we don't have the eternity. Life would have been good had that been the only problem. But, had that been the only problem, time wouldn't have been a problem in the first place. Without the thermodynamic arrow forever cruising towards chaos, irreversibility of time would have been less of an issue. But yes we know, entropy always increases. This may be less of a problem when you are trying to plan a trip to Antarctica next summer as funding and health are clearly bigger issues now. The Optimization The parameters are quantized and have been put into an objective. The constraints have been defined. It's time to optimize. Linearly or non-linearly, that's your choice, for your goal, in either case, shall remain the same. Maximize the constructive objectives, minimize the destructive ones. This might indicate the feasibility of your objective and whether it can be achieved. To answer how, however, you shall have to do some data collection and devise action plans. The conditionals. Leaders are readers. I heard that in some YouTube ad explaining why it is imperative to read books, because leaders do that. Quick question, which one happened first, reading books or success? Simple, books right? Yep, but how did we decide reading books lead to success? Because successful people read. 
So, we first selected the successful ones and then we inquired whether they read books. Probabilistically, the order seems to be unimportant from this argument, and that happens when reading books and succeeding are both independent variables. Thing again, wasn't the whole point just to prove that the former leads to the latter? Therefore, to ask whether leaders read is futile. Instead, we would have to ask whether readers become leaders. If we have this data, we can proceed to conclude that reading books voraciously is the ultimate path to success. The data. Hmm, where's the data? Following the logic of time and thermodynamic constraints, humans have evolved to maximize the economic potential of analyzed data. That's why you have millions of analyses of billionaires' net worths. The data about the set complement is not as abundant. Analyze this data and we're bound to introduce biases in our analyses. So, the solution? We can use ourselves as data points. Rather than calibrating ourselves to other members of the species, we might compare ourselves with ourselves from the past. Apple does that. You never hear how iPhone is 2x faster than Samsung flagship from their events, only that how iPhone N is 69% faster than iPhone N1. This habit of comparing to the self from the past might yield more statistically significant results as in either case you are expected to be in similar conditions except for the time frame. The Matrix You have gathered whatever data you could manage and now you must devise a plan to act upon. All you need are two dimensions of data and now you can semi-quantize them to form Punnett squares. You may name each box formed and identify whether it is a positive or a negative place to be in. For example, you might analyze the last six months and find out your productivity in terms of blog posts written and mental health in terms of mosquitoes smashed, when I get angry, I kill mosquitoes but somehow there always remains more yet to be killed. You can weekly log your results and define limits to separate the data into two parts. Fewer than 50 weekly mosquitoes and 5 plus weekly blog posts would mean that I was happy and productive. This is a good place to be in. 50 plus mosquitoes and 0 to 5 posts would refer to anger and procrastination, a red zone. 0 to 50 mosquitoes and 0 to 5 posts would be happy and procrastinating. Finally, 50 plus mosquitoes and 5 plus posts would mean angry but productive. The last two situations would be classified as orange. This way, you end up creating a discrete Cartesian coordinate for your actions. If you manage to highlight the red zones and plan to improve upon them, global improvement in your life becomes inevitable. The checklist. All I can say is, if you make checklists, you have a tool Gawande's blessings. Creating a checklist converts the abstract concept of undone work into a manageable list of achievable goals. And then, you might have subtasks under each task. The more modular the list, the greater the generalizability of the experience earned from completing each task. The graph. These last four steps can constitute a golden recursion. You search for data from your own experiences. You classify the data into chunks and draw an n-dimensional matrix to highlight different situations. You come up with a checklist to address the red zones. Then you summarize your findings into a graph. This provides data, in turn, for your next cycle of data collection and the wheel of time keeps revolving. The Gamification The final destination in our attempt to appreciate the statistics of success before succeeding itself is gamification. Apps like Habitica will help you achieve the same. In fact, in the attempt to gamify life, chances are you might dive in so deeply into gamification, you might start up a YouTube channel and document your journey. Then when you finally succeed, your experience shall remain as an anecdote of a human who strived for success and finally achieved it with each step being recorded for the posterity to be inspired by. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay Connect on LinkedIn Mail me, Saul Goodman said, let's just say I know a guy, who knows a guy, who knows another guy. Had this guy known another guy like the initial guy Saul knew chances are that at the sixth iteration he could have been referring to pretty much anyone in the world. Such is the concept of six degrees of separation which states that you are six handshakes away from anyone else in the world with the assumption that handshakes can take place only in between the people who each other. With 7.8 billion people, for this to be the reality every human will only have to know 45 other human beings. And that's a safe number as research suggests the number of people a human can have a stable relationship with is somewhere between 100 and 250 with the often quoted number being 150, the Dunbar's number. If that was the reality, the degrees of separation would soon drop to 4.5. 
And that's not even the end, the modern social landscape is dominated by social networking websites such as LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Considering every connection, friend and mutual follower to be a relation, that number easily drops to 3.5 in case of Facebook. The consequences of this number are outrageous. A hyperconnected world means viral news and media can spread like wildfire with just 3.5 stops between any two individuals. To investigate further into the workings of a network, we need a way to visualize the same. You can think of some space and then for every individual draw a point and for every connection between A2, think of a line joining the two dots. Now, what is the least number of lines you need to join every point? Since one line joins two points, n points will require, n1, lines. However, this resultant network won't be very well connected. Arranging all these points in a circle, if you wish to reach a diametrically opposite point, you would have to trot over every intervening point. From now onwards you may wish to follow along with a pencil and a piece of paper. For a world with three dots, the average degree of separation is one. Nice, that means everyone knows each other. With four dots, the average jumps up to 1.33 and 1.5 with a pentagonal network. Any guesses what the average path length will be for a hexagonal network? 1.8 it is, in Yoda's voice. Scaling this up to bigger networks maybe with 40 or 50 nodes, we start to approach a simulation of a locality. Continuing the exercise above, you'll find that the average path length grows quickly as more nodes get added. In real life, this would mean had we been closely related only to our neighbors, human networks would have been very exclusive. But in a network with 50 nodes, if you introduce just two connections connecting two diametrically opposite nodes, the PA length drops dramatically. This result is pretty significant in the real world. It explains how just six handshakes or even lesser, on average, can connect any two human beings. Most of the humans have most of their connections originating from their locality or niche of the profession. Only some of our connections live abroad probably in a different profession. These weak ties bring us closer to a whole new country of connections. In mathematics, Paul Erdős had some contributions in this field of graph theory and networking. This lead to the popular convention of Erdős numbers. If you had co-authored a paper with Erdős, you get an Erdős number of 1. If you co-authored with a guy who co-authored with Erdős, you would have 2. And in case you were wondering, Erdős had Erdős number 0. P.S. That's not a factorial. To summarize and therefore justify the title, to make the most of your connections, you should always try to make friends slash acquaintances among people from different geographic locations and professions. This would bring you exponentially closer to distant networks. Now that we have talked about a strategy to be mathematically popular and have done justice to the title of the post, we can dive a little deeper into types of graphs and possible applications in the world. With the raging pandemic, the importance of networks has become particularly important. If you consider every human to be a node then every transmission can be represented as an edge, a connection. Employing the same concept discussed above, most humans will transmit the disease to people near them. But once in a while, some legend would travel abroad aboard an airplane infecting everyone on the way and then everyone at the destination. Just one connection would be the reason for the introduction of the pathogen in a different network. Now you can see why quarantining is important and why banning air travel becomes one of the first measures to curb the spread of disease. Any measure to stop a connection between two distant networks yields benefits. One distinctive feature between the network of human connections and infections is that the latter is directed. There are some interesting ways to visualize directed graphs. If we assume that someone infected once either recovers or loses their life, the graph becomes an acyclic directed graph. This way the patient zero becomes the root node and everyone else a node in the branching directed acyclic graph, DAGs. Surprisingly a similar structure is used in a cryptocurrency called IOTA. IOTA uses DAGs to point to newer blocks of transactions and solves many of the problems of resource intensiveness of Bitcoin. Representing graphs can be done using adjacency matrices. If it is cyclical, every node can map onto itself or some other node. Imagine a matrix with all the row headers populated by from nodes and column headers by to nodes. This provides an easy way to introduce principles of linear algebra while dealing with such directed graphs. Its use can be seen in natural language processors as such matricial representations are essential for stochastic models like Markov chains. 
A different type of graph called binary trees is also popular which diverge from a root node and has only two branches from every node. Its uses are plenty with Huffman coding being an interesting one in the field of lossless data compression. In the human body, the motor system demonstrates an interesting divergent tree whereas the vascular system acts a directed cyclic graph. Finally, there's our brain. We applaud the ability to make connections between different fields of study as often it gives rise to novel solutions to problems. Thanks to associative senses we can experience senses from different organs all converging to paint a unifying picture in our subjective space. To achieve such levels of intelligence, neurons in our brain has to be particularly interconnected to ensure maximum integration within a limited volume. No doubt nature had figured out the best way to manipulate networks way before we did and today we can see the evidence in every duct system in the plant and the animal world. From epidemiology to sociology and neuroscience to cryptocurrencies, graph theory plays a vital role. What's fascinating is how useful a dot and a line can be we carefully study the vast multitude of ways in which they can be combined to form graphs and trees. Archetype Mukopadhyay Connect on LinkedIn Mail me, greater than every once in a while a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. Greater than greater than Steve Jobs, on introducing the iPhone. Turns out that every 50 years or so, a disruptive new technology emerges and greatly influences our society. It improves our lives, shuffles the rich lists and throws the economy into the booming phase of a fresh new Kondratiev cycle. Just like a colony of microorganisms, these cycles sprout off of a breakthrough in science which opens new doors in the realm of technology slowly gather momentum, exponentiates in adoption, reaches a pinnacle and finally, instead of withering away, gets taken for granted and therefore disappears from headlines. The first three cycles. It all started about 250 years back, a couple of decades before the 19th century with the invention of the steam engine. It gave rise to the development of mechanized mills and looms such as the Jackard's Loom, 1804, that reinvented the textile industry. Richest people of those times were merchants trading clothes or the businessmen owning mills. About 50 years hence, the steel industry started to flourish. Coupled with steam engines the railroad industry rose to prominence and mass transport soar in popularity. With this revolution, the New World, North America, raced forwards to become an economic powerhouse overshadowing Europe. Billionaires such as Andrew Carnegie made fortunes by being a tycoon in the American steel industry, despite coming from, almost fittingly, a Scottish family of handloom weavers. Roll 50 more years forwards to the end of the 19th century and you would witness the rise of consumerism. Classical physics was having its conclusions written in a world blissfully unaware of both the quantum domain and the expanding universe toyed with the newly discovered electricity from physics and organic compounds, plastics, from chemistry. Every new invention was getting was deriving its power from electricity and the neighborhoods were getting connected by power lines. This was the era of Edison and Tesla and much of today's world is shaped by the inventions of this time. Radio, light bulb, electric machines, plastics, etc. were populating the world and we were starting to discover that we desired things we didn't really need. THE4TH cycle You like fast cars? You gotta thank the fourth cycle. Starting just before the Great Depression and enduring on was the revolution in the petroleum and the automobile industry. From uneven roads of horse trails and horse dumps, we evolved into modern roads with tire tracks and oil stains. Whereas the second cycle solved the translocation for the industries, the fourth cycle solved transportation for the individuals. Rich lists were topped by Ford and owning a car became a necessity rather than a luxury. THE5TH cycle. Any guesses what this one would be? Here's a hint. You are reading this article because of this revolution. That's right. We're talking about the revolution in information technology. With the invention of the IBM microchip in 1970 the IT industry, that was kicked off by Turing and Shannon's brilliance in the 40s, sprang to life. Within 20 years the internet was discovered. And 10 years later at the turn of the new century were born many of the companies that would dominate the tech industry at the present, such as Google and Amazon. Data became the new oil. There's no surprise that most of the billionaires in today's world are the internet moguls. Greater than source, Nefiatif, Leo, and Nefiatif, Simone, the 6th Kondratiev, 2014. The Four Phases 
Analyzing the stock prices in the USA's S&P 500 each cycle can roughly be divided into four parts. Although these are massive generalizations, they do bring out some parallelism between technology revolutions and the evolution of a colony in an ecosystem with limited resources. Analyzing these metaphors, therefore, become oddly satisfying. Spring of Creativity When a new technology is invented, the early adopters are nothing short of being a contemporary Columbus. They create the earliest use cases of the technology and help spread the initial word and spark the initial fire. Fearless investors pour their fortune into this new pot expecting returns in the future. Headlines start to appear proclaiming this new technology to solve every conceivable problem. Sooner than not, our expectations from the technology overshoot its capability to deliver. Summer of Quality In spring, amateurs and professionals are virtually indistinguishable. As summer approaches, the professionals soar ahead. Huge companies start to rise into prominence and the interest in investing in the sector of this innovation skyrockets. The innovation serves the developed countries first and gradually starts to spread as the price of adoption begins to plummet. This phase sees the conversion of luxuries into utilities. Autumn of Sustainability Sort of like the Middle Ages and Shakespeare's Seven Ages, the industry matures in this phase. The influx of investment slows down. Technology witnesses wider adoption. It starts to benefit the masses. In the end, the market corrects itself, as seen in the bursting of the dot-com bubble, and the technological boom begins its fall. Winter of Utility Winter is always coming. No technology, howsoever revolutionary now, would be taken for granted sufficiently into the future. The hype eventually dies. Newer contemporaries eventually outpace the old. Magic, once you know the secret of, fails to entertain. But technology rarely evaporates. It matures into sectors upon whose shoulders newer technologies develop. Without the transportation industry, the giants of IT would have had a hard time developing quality hardware. Similarly, without the level of communication, we have achieved today, building future innovations would have been simply unimaginable. Greater than source https colon slash slash static dot financial sense dot com slash historical slash users slash u111 slash images slash 2012 slash 4 condrati of wave 1789 to 2003 dot jpg the 6 th cycle there's a lot of speculation about what this cycle would be about the image above hails holistic health as the one other estimations focus more on virtual and augmented reality while some consider the revolution in the financial industry, with PayPal, Bitcoin and Stripe, to comprise the sixth Gondratiev cycle. However, there's no doubt that we're currently inhabiting the end of the fifth cycle. Though the sparks for the sixth cycle seems to be kinda overdue, given that most revolutions begin after depression, the chance that we might be entering a world full of possibility right after this pandemic leaves us hopeful. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay Connect on LinkedIn Mail me had the apple not fallen that day Newton might still have formulated the laws of gravitation. But for today's article we'll presume that either gravity wasn't discovered until the ripe old age of 21st century, or that you're reading reading this article in the 17th century. Either way, gravity isn't discovered yet. And the responsibility to discover it rests solely upon our shoulders. Now, we're not physicists. We're just some common 17th century human with a curiosity. We like to perform thought experiments in lonely solitude and then scribble down some stuff when the information overflows our memory. From now onwards, I'll swiftly change the first person plural to a second person singular pronoun, I hope you won't mind. Every day you walk from your home to your farm. You have to first walk for 5 kilometers straight then take a right and walk 5 more kilometers west. One fine day you injure your ankle a little and wish your farm was closer. Now technically your farm can be closer if you can take a shorter path. That's to say trot over your neighbor's farm and follow a hypotenuse. In a momentary spirit of evil intentions, you enter their farm and step upon a few crops. As the stalks crush beneath your soul, you proceed unhindered. Half an hour later you reach your farm. It did indeed come closer. From 5 plus 5 equals 10 kilometers it is now sqrt 5 squared plus 5 squared kilometers or about 7 kilometers. You just saved yourself 3 kilometers of walking with an injured ankle, and 3 more considering the return. All this leaves a strong impression upon your mind. 
A week later you go for a vacation. It's a hilly area with a threat of wildlife venturing arbitrarily in town to feast on human flesh. You learn that natives here have devised a method to throw a rock at these wildlifes to scare them away. But sadly, they miss the target most of the times. You decide to give them an advice. You ask them to build a wooden wedge and tie heavy rocks on top and the bottom near the forest road. So that when the animals pass the spot the rocks can be released and then they will hit the animal at the earliest. It sounded like a better idea than having humans throw the rocks. It did work for a few times but this plan too mostly missed. On the last day of your vacation you learn that the wooden plank had broken under the weight of the rocks and has been deformed into a curved shape. Yet surprisingly, this curved wedge worked every time hence and knocked out ten animals in a row. You return home confused why the rocks descend quicker down a curved path than the obviously shorter hypotenuse. It seems the path of shortest time and shortest length don't coincide in the vertical direction. This somewhat baffles you but you soon forget about it. Then the next week your naughty nephew arrives. Being an absolute package of ungodly mischief as he is, he starts kicking around one of your nice and round earthen pots. Something tells you you'll soon learn the definition of karma. Next morning someone tells you that your nephew is in your farm. Now given that you're a thoughtful person, you had carefully designed your farm. When the winter arrived and yield was low, that is, now, your farm would have a gradient of grasses from heavy growth to light. At one end the farm was as green as jealousy. The other end was as brown as the soil, because it was literally the color of the soil. Your nephew was standing on the green side and kicking your earthen pots which graciously rolled its way up to the other end. Yep, that's karma. In the process it simply ruined the beautiful lush green grasses that grew in its track. As soon as you enter the farm, you stand dumbstruck. Not because of your nephew's deeds but rather due to the shape of the tracks. These immediately remind you of a curved plank you had observed in your vacation. You rush home and start to think. In your farm as the density of grasses got rarer, the quicker the round pot rolled. Therefore it could cover equal longitudinal distance even if its angle got a bit obtuse, thanks to its higher speed. And this, resulted in the curved path as the reduction in the resistive forces of the grasses caused continuous increase in the velocity of rolling pot. It was almost as if someone pulled the pot harder as it proceeded. This effect seems to be absent when such forces in the direction of motion are absent. Since such gradients of grasses are a rarity, horizontal motion mostly yields straight line travel at an angle. Now air seems to have no such gradient right up front. That means, and wait for it my friend, every falling object must have some invisible force pulling on it because the similar curved trajectory is observed when an object travels in a vertical plane. That is why it is so difficult to jump and keep going up forever. This force, whatever it is, reduces your speed till it's zero and then starts pulling you down faster. You try to draw this trajectory from your memory of the bend wooden plank and curved grass trails. Your nephew reaches home meanwhile. Dude sees your drawing. He says, ha ha, that's just what my tire valve does. You jump up, your tire valve? He shows you a tire that he often rolls in his free time down the road with a stick and this tire has an inlet valve. As the tire translates and rotates, aka rolls, this valve traces out a weird semicircle-like path. Apparently your nephew had seen this pattern from afar and had identified this pattern with your drawing. You roll some tires, draw some diagrams and come up with the conclusion that any fixed point on the circumference of a rolling circle traces out this curvy shape, which is exactly the path of shortest travel between two points when there is a pull or push in one of the dimensions. Centuries pass and today your name is associated with the first proof that Earth exerts a force on every object and the discovery of brachistochrones and cycloids. Lucky you. Now you're immortal in the story of science. The reason I wrote this was to emphasize on the fact that discoveries in sciences rarely follow a molded path. New discoveries can happen from daily observations and may come from ordinary people. Had Newton not discovered gravity somebody else would have done it. How that would have happened is just as unknown as gravity was before its discovery. This is to say that, never stop asking questions as there is no blueprint of scientific success that lies ahead. Although with the present scientific sophistication simple ideas turning into blockbusters have become less probable, the fact that the same discoveries can be made in multiple ways still remains true. And that sounds awesome as this portrays science as a field full of possibilities rather than the strict discipline which it is often portrayed as in our schools. Cheers! 
RK Deep Mukopadhyay. Connect on LinkedIn. Mail me. Every day I wake up at 3 a.m. If it's a weekend, however, I go to sleep at 3 a.m. I brush my teeth, go for a run, browse Reddit, and listen to Eminem. Some elderly people from nearby residences often join me for their morning walk. To ensure that I keep myself socially distant, I minutely change my trajectory as long as I'm within a few feet of them. What you read was a simple paragraph. Yet, it contained the semantics of a basic programming language. If you stare at it hard enough, you'll discover simple recursions, conditionals and even data types such as arrays of strings. No wonder why high-level programming languages attempt to resemble English. For English itself, kinda imperfectly, can be spoken very declaratively. And in case you were wondering, nope, the first paragraph isn't an accurate description of my life. Data Types One might say that spoken languages simply consist of strings. That is true, given that we rarely employ methods to completely segregate parts of sentences, but even if you observe this very sentence, you'll appreciate clauses which bring order into relatively chaotic statements. You won't find a literal dictionary in English, and I use English as a representative, it might as well be any spoken language, however, arrays and variables are quite abundant. Every time someone mentions a list of things all segregated by commas or ors and ands, they are, in a very loose way. A lot of the words in English are used as variables which momentarily refer to the part of the information we are interested in. This and that and the pronouns all turn out to be variables in that sense. Logical operations and conditionals. Is this sentence true? This sentence is true. Well, I don't know for sure, but that initial is is doing a lot of work here. Single-handedly by jumping from the first, programmers read zeroth, place to the third, programmers read second, it turned the sentence from interrogative into a declaration. Similarly in our speech, we are time and again using conditionals with such operators. From if it rains to if I succeed, these operations may not always be logical but surely approximates an inquiry into nature followed by conditional statements. With ifs and tons we have developed a pretty well-equipped arsenal of conditionals and operators that Recursions You can say, I was blah years old when the millennium turned and that day I took a bath, next day I took a bath, next I took a bath, next I took a bath, next I took a bath, took a bath or you might just say I have taken a bath daily since the turn of the millennia. Recursions have been easily encoded in a sentence with just a single word like every or none. With multi-word combos like keeps on we get an even better taste of recursive properties. Functions Function is a verb, literally but all verbs are functions, figuratively. They might be complex functions which are Russian dolls of subsequent component functions, or they might be very straightforward simple ones. There might be operators which take in a noun as input and modify the meaning. When you say I will perform, no one knows what you will perform. To perform, by itself has very little meaning, in contrast with say, to sleep or even to say. If you, however, say I will perform tympanoplasty, people would immediately appreciate that you are intending to perform a combination of myringoplasty and ossicoloplasty, thus decomposing the complex verb into relatively simple ones. What makes natural language natural? There might be a better answer to this question, but the main reason why natural language triumphs over the ones we code in, is because the computers that parse it, can make incredible connections through intuition and instincts. Like, you might someone in Bang On start to talk about how the Spurs defeated the Red Devils. You wouldn't even have to highlight the game nor the proper names of the teams and people might already have made the connections. No time wasted in importable from football, you get direct action. A better example would be, how you can talk about your job, pause for a second, make a remark on the weather, sneeze hard, say bless me. Resume your conversation and the person listening to you will still appreciate what's being told. Another more philosophical difference is that natural languages are spoken from person to person. So, when you are listening to someone or reading someone, your brain is personifying the speaker or author with all sorts of extra information it can manage from the surroundings. When you are coding, the compiler or animation engine doesn't care about you nor about itself. It is just an inanimate piece of electricity-powered electronic state encoded on doped silicon. The last point is that natural languages can have double meanings and such situations are often intended. This, however, is a big no-no for programming. 
you can have entire paragraphs with underlying sarcastic undertones or euphemisms and if you dare, a double entendre sprinkled somewhere in between and an observant listener will appreciate it without any prior intimation. Chicken or the egg? You might argue, high-level programming languages are built to resemble naturally languages. Therefore, it is very circular to simply try to describe natural language in terms of the former. This is a classic chicken and egg problem and for this one, in particular, we are convinced the chicken came first. So, is this discussion futile? Maybe so. After all speaking to a human in Python is just as useless as typing out plain Victorian English to a Python compiler. Often when we are knee-deep into debugging, if we are debuggers, or reading literature, if we are bookworms, we forget how orderly our own speech and thought processes are. Every time we use words like every time, then, then, if, the conjunctions, the prepositions and in fact any part of speech, we are logically adding some new information to our conversation. Appreciating these logical constructs in our qualitative languages may not change civilization overnight, but it will help us gradually in two fronts. 1. It will make you a more observant speaker who possesses the skill to choose the correct word at the correct moment. On the other hand, Understanding spoken language in terms of coding language might open up new frontiers in natural language processing. After all, who wouldn't just love to have a long and thoughtful conversation with Siri and Alexa instead of being replied with I searched the web and found these results. To every spiritual question you ask them. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay. Connect on LinkedIn. Mail me. Lately in the COVID-19 context flattening the curve has always referred to the reduction of new daily cases. Yet, way before 2020, in 1569 Flemish geographer had managed to flatten a substantial curve. He projected the curved round earth onto a flat paper and published what we know today as the Mercator's projection of the world map. He achieved this by assuming the almost spherical earth to be present inside an infinitely long cylinder. This way every point on the surface of the earth would have a one-to-one correspondence with a point on the cylinder. This cylinder is just a 2D sheet of paper rolled into the aforementioned shape. After the projection is complete the paper would be unrolled and placed on a flat surface. Therefore we would obtain all the land masses and the water bodies right upon a flat paper, albeit a bit distorted towards the poles. But all that glitters is not gold. You can't just have a round surface mapped onto a paper and expect to get away with it without any distortions. And, when that map gets passed down from generations to generations, owing to the ease of production of printed sheets rather than mobile globes, there's no doubt that this representation of Earth's surface becomes engraved onto the minds of the majority. The problems encountered with the Mercator projection are as follows- Giant Greenland, you must have seen this coming. That island seems to be bigger than Africa. Clearly, something's wrong here. Unrolled Antarctica, Antarctica is a nice circular continent present right in the South Pole. Technically it's far from a circle with all its peninsulas, protruding glaciers and seas. But all in all, it's a closed shape with an appreciable circumference. But the projection cuts it open and unrolls it. This way, the entire bottom is Antarctica. No other continent is distorted as much. Infinite North Pole, where is the North Pole? It's everywhere. Every meridian meets at the poles. In Mercator projection, every meridian, longitude, is equally distanced. That means all of a sudden the North Pole is not a point but rather a line. In Mercator's projection, the top of the map is entirely the North Pole. This happens as the poles should ideally not map onto the cylinder, but making the cylinder infinite, it is assumed that light rays from the center emanating from the poles would eventually diverge onto the cylinder at infinity. The need for a center, globes are good. They revolve. Maps don't. That means maps have a center. And thanks to the way our psychology works, it's the center that demands more attention. This creates weird illusions of the East and the West. Conventionally, Europe sits at the center, but that might have been the Americas just as well or even Asia. But, of all the other problems, this one can be solved only by altering our mentality. When we visualize every region with respect, simple maps won't succeed in distorting our perception about our planet and its nations. The barely visible Bering Strait, Bering Strait separates Russia from Alaska. Had it not been there, the U.S. would have been Russia's neighbor. Technically with the Diomede Islands, they are not far from being that though. The Bering Strait appears right at the edges mostly in the left edge and at times on the right. 
a globe does better justice to this water body. World War II Surprise While reading the events that unfolded in World War II, I used to think Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor which was probably in the Atlantic. When I learned that it was in the Pacific, I was surprised for a second as it seemed counterintuitive and farther away from Japan. In reality, Japan is way closer to the western coast than the Atlantic coast. This unfortunate fragmentation of the map also immediately fails to explain why the pre-Cold War U.S. would like to form allies with Japan, South Korea, etc. The Flat Earth Mapping Mars By the end of this decade, we might have men on Mars. Therefore, it's imperative that we invest in understanding its surface landmarks. Here's an annotated picture of Mars. Hmm, that doesn't really a lot, does it? Okay, maybe we won't have to know the Martian surface in that detail, but we can make some attempts. Here, this image will suffice, this is a Mercator projection of Martian surface that enhances the contrast in elevations and depths and colors the lowlands like water bodies. Just remember the following points. Earth is lower in the north and higher in the south. Had Mars been flooded with water, which may have been the case a long time ago, north would have been a giant ocean, Thyestidas borealis, the vast north, with multiple channels flowing into it, Thias marineris being the primary one. The south would have had a giant lake in the Hellas basin which is an asteroid create. Near the North Ocean you'll find the highest lands of Mars. The triplet of Tharsis Montes which are three high volcanoes gradually eroding and creating the Tharsis Rise which is a plateau. To the northwest, and I'm using the west term loosely here, you may consider west equals left and east equals right, you'll find the tallest mountain of the solar system named Olympus Mons, which is 27 kilometers tall. Briefly to the north is another high rise the Alba Mons which is relatively older and is gradually eroding down, much like all the old world mountains of Earth and unlike the Himalayas where the rate of erosion still lags behind tectonic activities which are resulting in an increase of size. The north is relatively smooth owing to the fact that the crust here is newer probably due to all those volcanoes, whereas the south is pockmarked with asteroid and meteor craters suggesting that the crust here is old. Right at the South Pole you'll find condensed dry ice which though is smaller in volume than the Greenland glaciers, might play a substantial role in releasing CO2, a greenhouse gas, and making Mars habitably again, MMHA. A cool correlation can be derived from the 3D map of Mars if the Hellas Basin seems to be exactly antipodal, opposite, to Alba Mons. Similar antipodal relations between depressions and highlands can be obtained upon carefully navigating the surface. This suggests that both of these may share the same event as its origin. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay Connect on LinkedIn Mail me, please read this sentence. Thanks for reading that. Just as you read it, photons emitted by the screen hit your retina, hyperpolarize the photoreceptors, generated an action potential that started to propagate through the optic nerves. If Elon had implanted a biocompatible electrode there, he could have easily snatched your visual input and displayed it on a screen somewhere. Worse yet, if he had it implanted just a little above the optic nerves, right inside the prefrontal cortex, he might have even read into your thoughts. Or maybe not, the technology hasn't advanced that much yet. But the math sure does exist, and Elon does exist, and so does Neuralink. So, we better explore the basics before someone pirates our thoughts. Detecting Action Potentials Okay, first of all, the first paragraph was unnecessarily dramatized just to grab your attention. If we can ever read into or manipulate thoughts, the first applications will most definitely be in the medical field where it could be of tremendous help to the patients enduring motor impairments. With that out of the way, we can focus on a single neuron. Now I don't have a microscope handy, so you gotta trust me, from a macroscopic view neurons are very simple elements. They receive inputs. If the inputs cross a threshold, they send outputs. That's all they do. The inputs come either from biotransducers called receptors or other neurons. There might be multiple inputs and each input has a weight associated with it. When the total weighted sum crosses a threshold, a spike potential will be generated and it will propagate through the axon. This propagation is more of a gallop than a sprint. The axons, elongated parts of the neurons, are ensheathed with insulating fatty myelin that prevents the dissipation of the potential. At regular intervals there exist nodes of Rondier which allow the exchange of ions that markedly speed up the transmission of the moving dipole. As the dipole moves, 
It creates local changes in ionic concentration and very feeble electrical fields that electrodes can pick up provided someone, and we're looking at you Elon, manages to place a sensitive enough electrode inside the skull. This can then be analyzed with advanced data science. Normally an action potential consists of an up curve of depolarization and a down curve of repolarization that overshoots into hyperpolarization. When observed in bulk, they look like a series of spikes. Now tell me, what mathematical function do you think fits this kind of graph? That is a flat line with occasional spikes. Recording of Gertrude's implanted electrodes from Neuralink demo. Modeling action potentials. When we discuss mathematical functions, we normally think of exponentials and polynomials. Step functions, for being a little ill-behaved, normally evade our conversations. Ceiling function. A simpler step function would be the heavy side step function that steps only at the origin. Heavy side step function. If we differentiate this function, we get something peculiar. It's called the Dirac delta function and this can surprisingly come in handy when dealing with spike potentials observed during our neuronal transmission. The Dirac delta function. When there are multiple spikes, we can integrate the delta function over the entire domain of observation and calculate the average using the temporal length of the domain to find the firing rates. We know that action potentials show all or none phenomena and therefore when a receptor is stimulated by a particular stimulus, its firing rate, and not the amplitudes, would increase. By analyzing the firing rates as a function of a given stimulus we can identify which pathways respond to which type of stimulus. Then, all we need is the input from the brain of our subject and without examining the external environment, we'll find out how the subject perceives the environment. These delta functions can often be hard to work with. Thus, defining them as a Gaussian bell curve with a width tending to zero gives us a workable equation and a framework to play with and work towards understanding the neural code that different parts of the brain communicate with. Using a Gaussian to approximate a Dirac delta function. So, so, we are still far away from stealing thoughts. Then again, as recently as in 1989, we could have sworn we were far away from communicating with our friend chilling in Antarctica and receiving a reply back with the entire process taking less than even a second. As computational power exponentiates and algorithms become more efficient, we shall eventually start to understand the mysterious ways in which our brain works. Archadeep Mukhopadhyay Connect on LinkedIn Mail me, all hail the great DNA. Shouted an army of microtubules from a prominent locus in the cytoplasm. DNA, DNA. Clap 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 DNA, DNA. Shouted out all the organelles of the cell, from the juniors like gluoxisms to the seniors like mitochondria, all alike. Although the envious RNAs looked on with inaudible grunts and disapproving growls, they too had to submit after a few minutes of cheerleading the boss, the great dictator, DNA. Unlike every other dictator DNA did not have its roots in desperation to overthrow the existing rule. It was a born hero. Ever since deoxyribonucleic acid, who goes by the name of DNA among his followers, was synthesized in a primordial soup of nutrients few billion years ago, it had been widely accepted as the boss. Till today, no one else, has been able to overthrow its dominance. In case you wonder, why? You should ask the historians of cytology, the introns, who are reminiscent of antiquity. They, though themselves made up of DNA, will tell you that DNA's secret to dominance in genetic inheritance is due its stability. Lack of a hydroxyl group in the pentose sugar, unlike RNA, presence of methylation in nitrogen bases, i.e. thymine of DNA instead of uracil of RNA, double-stranded nature as compared to mostly single-stranded RNA suffices for its ascension in the throne of cytodictator overthrowing the RNA rule. DNA also takes keen interest in self-replication, having sequences to code for proteins, that synthesize two newer daughter DNAs from the parent one. It is not fickle-minded like RNA, and undergoes mutation fairly stably, hence, the DNA which coded for peptidoglycan 3 billion years ago, still codes for the same NAG non-polymer today. But, my intention to write today's article, is to narrate the DNA's dictation. It begins with transcription. A puzzle that DNA asks its subordinate RNA to solve. Often, while slithering through the great lengths of a DNA molecule, you will find a sequence that urges RNA factories to bind to the location. Following that promoter sequence which initiates the game, 
is the main puzzle that DNA asks RNA to solve. Like a dutiful servant, RNA factory aka RNA polymerase transcribes DNA's blabbering code into a not very different RNA code. This new RNA has a fancy name, mRNA, M for messenger as all it does is transport the info to cytoplasm where other versatile RNAs wait hungrily to solve the code. Before the transportation though, mRNA likes to dress up, capped by an awkward N base and tailed by an A obsessive tail. Also it undergoes dieting i.e. cutting away of any intervening transcribed historians aka introns, whom we met before. All this happens inside the nucleus. Outside the comfort of nucleus wanders about millions of ribosomes. Renas who run each ribosome, like to call themselves protein factories. They allow the mRNA for a night stay and read up their transcribed code, to steal amino acids from charged turnas and synthesize proteins. Quite hardworking, ain't they? This is called translation. The language of RNA world is then translated into the language of proteins, with words called amino acids, that are understandable by every cell component. It took humanity 11,953 years to decipher this process, since 10,000 BC, which was about 64 years before today. Though thanks for that usually goes to Watson, Crick, Wilkins, and Chargaff, let us take this opportunity to thank Rosalind Franklin, who had probably the greatest contribution among them and yet the least recognition. Before concluding, I want you to know that, this DNA is a bad guy. It has a closed community and 46 family members in human cells. They break up equally into two groups randomly, then associate with another such group of 23 from another human, and combines to dictate orders in a new cell, which we humans superficially term as birth of a new life. P.S. This article was initially published in 2017. R.K. Deep Mukopadhyay. Connect on LinkedIn. Mail me, you're on your way sitting on a train. You look outside and you see Dr. Hannibal Lecter standing. He's just standing there. On a wooden platform. Suddenly, he raises his hand. Waves. He takes a step forward. You jump back. He falls off the wood and before you can regain your courage he's a hundred meters behind you. You see, you were on a train. For Lecter to appear still outside your vehicle, he too must have been traveling at exactly the same velocity upon that wooden platform which was probably that makeshift railcar Tin Tin had built in Soviet. This example is absolutely unreal. What's true here though is that oftentimes things that appear still and devoid of animation are quite action-packed in the background. You can check out the post titled Oops! Captain is dead! And see how a spaceship might approach the space station at the speed of only a few centimeters per second even though both ISS and the spaceship is traveling at about 7.66 kilometers per second. You may have seen a glass full of water. Ah, such still water. Almost reminds you of a still lake. Except, neither is still at a microscopic level. Especially not so at the surface. Molecules keep on evaporating off of the surface of a water body into the atmosphere and molecules keep on condensing into the water body from the atmosphere. There's always this tug of war between the liquid and vapor state. Pretty much why the surface experiences a vapor pressure. Had water been colorful, you would have seen a gradient of gradually diminishing color above the surface as the vapor density decreased with height due to diffusion into the surroundings. Feel like testing it? Heat the glass. That hands over excess energy to the water molecules. They start vibrating and moving like crazy. As a result, more escape out into the air when compared to molecules condensing in. By heating the water you altered the conditions of an equilibrium that existed previously. Nature in turn altered the configuration of the equilibrium and boiled the water off so as to counter the change induced by you. All this points towards the fundamental importance of equilibria in nature. Some of these equilibria are stable. This means if you try to induce some change into the system you'll experience negative feedback loops bringing you back to square one. Had the equilibrium been unstable, positive feedback loops would have greeted you in turn. All this makes us believe that stable equilibria are ultimate. Eventually everything should therefore settle into the lowest energy state and be guarded by negative feedback loop which would prevent any changes to itself. Yet left by itself, many natural systems never settle into a single configuration, it keeps on altering. Biology has several example of oscillators. The population of prey and predators show such seasonal variations. 
Too many deers in a forest overpopulate the niche and depletes the edible leaves. As a result the wolf population spikes. When wolves explode in number, too many deers get eaten. This gives the forest the opportunity to grow back leaves with fewer herbivores around. As deer number drops, wolves can't sustain their colonies. Eventually, wolves too start to die or migrate. This gives rise to a higher deer population once again with the forest invitingly filled with less green foliage. Such observations play an important role in establishing a biosphere from scratch which sounds fancy but is pretty much what we try to achieve when creating a garden albeit in a much smaller scale. Monocultures such as plantations are bad for nature as it fails to build up an ecosystem around it and therefore lacks the promise of oscillations. As soon as the environmental parameters stray beyond the comfortable zone no more checks and balances exist to bring it back into the ideal state. To summarize, we can just appreciate how majorly the commutativity of addition distorts our sense of reality as we often use numbers to represent natural parameters and these values can be subject to two opposing forces which equally influence the parameter in opposite directions and all that a shallow observer would notice is how constant the value appears. RK Deep Mukopadhyay Connect on LinkedIn. Mail me. Of all the things in mathematics, the last thing we expect is to witness two absolutely irrational constants appear alongside each other in way more than one single situation. In this short post we'll try to uncover what makes e and pi somewhat related to each other. Within the next few hundred words, we'll update the way we view these constants and get acquainted with a simple flowchart that directly connects the two of these. Firstly, to set the stage let's remind ourselves that traditionally pi is witnessed in everything circling. On a two-dimensional plane should you plot all the points that are equidistant from a central one, you end up with an infinite number of concentric circles. Interestingly, for all these concentric circles when the circumference gets divided by the distance from the center the answer turns out to be the twice of pi. This is true for every circle. And we all accept that. Now save some of your money in an awesome bank that offers you 100% interest per year that gets compounded every instant. After a year you'll end up with the money you saved multiplied by E. Let the money sit for twice the unit time and it gets multiplied by E squared. The circle for pi and compound interest for E are the most common rendezvous points between a student and these constants. Yet hidden deep within these examples is a common ground. Both of them involves an infinitesimal change occurring at every instant. If we would have compounded at 100% per annum for a year we would have simply doubled our principal. Had we turned only once while going from one equidistant point of a central point to another located at right angles, we would have ended up with a perimeter that is twice the distance from center at those points. In the first case E popped up when we started to compound at every instant. The circle formed and pi popped up when we started to turn by an infinitesimal amount at every instant. There's no doubt that Euler's formula connects pi and any the most elegantly. We'll therefore take the Euler highway to connect the two. We won't derive the formula neither dive into any details but just point out the intervening machinery separating pi and e. We saw how pi is inbuilt into the definition of the circle. When we represent a circle in our usual Cartesian coordinates we like to do it by designating the x and y coordinates of the curve of the circle to sine and cosine of x respectively. Let's pause here for a second. Now e initially came up as the constant that the exponential function evaluates with x as 1. And what is the exponential function? It's just an infinite series that is the expansion of an expression which is a trade of between how fast you want to grow and how long you want to grow. All very compound interests why. Just that this exponential function is found when there exists a limit towards infinity with regard to the iteration of our growth and zero with regards to the amount of growth per iteration. You expand this out and you get a polynomial that yields ever diminishing higher order terms. Evaluate the same at 1 and the series gives you e. An infinite series gives you a constant with infinite digits? Well that seems to fit. Interestingly enough, both sine and cosine of any variable could also be expressed in terms of a series similar to e such that when you combine sine and cosine in a particular ratio, that of the imaginary number i, you surprisingly end up with the exponential function. The involvement of i here is purely justified as it has the beautiful property of alternating between plus 1 and minus 1 as it gets raised to higher and higher powers. And that's it. E is related to sine and cosine and so is pi and that connects the two. E gets connected to trigonometric ratios when we think analytically and pi gets connected to trigonometry when we think geometrically. 
And in the end we end up with an algebraic expression with an awfully named imaginary number starring in a cameo. Ha, huh, maths. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay. Connect on LinkedIn. Mail me, this is like snakes on a plane but on steroids. Instead of a plane, you're on a spacecraft. Instead of snakes, there's a dead captain. And your mission, should you choose to accept it, would be to dock the craft right onto the ISS. With six degrees of freedom for translatory motion and six more for rotational alongside the ordeal of matching the speed of a giant artificial satellite that's revolving around the Earth at 7.66 km per second, all while trying not to fall back upon thy mother Earth and get roasted by the atmosphere in the process, you might have to pop a sweat or two to achieve your goal. So, you start one kilometer away from the ISS traveling at 8.1 km per second. You see the ISS approaching you at half a kilometer per second. This speed seems to be lesser but it actually is 1,800 km per hour or 300 times faster than your ordinary speed limit. So, it's fast. Life in the orbit, however, is not very simple. The faster you go around the Earth, the higher you go above the Earth. The ISS hovers at about 408 kilometers above Earth. Your craft has achieved this height thanks to the effort by your captain who is chilling beside you. You look over. Wait. He's dead, you say. He is indeed dead. There's important cargo in your ship, we'll call it a ship from now on. And, it's your duty to get it safely on board the ISS. On Earth where we usually move on two dimensions, with gravity keeping us grounded, going from A to B is quite easy. In space, a dimension gets added. In orbit, thanks to gravity your height becomes a function of resultant velocity in the two perpendicular directions. In vacuum, every force you exert is not cancelled out by air resistance. Combine all this and you're in for a treat. You calm yourself and try to visualize the six dimensions. If you move fast, you go up. You can't. Your height is okay. So, for every reduction in speed, you must move up a little. Thankfully there are thrusters just for that. So, you try to slow down and move up simultaneously. Right at this point, you see six more controls. You hit one and boom, ISS starts to rotate clockwise. No wait, it's your craft that's rotating counterclockwise. How do you cancel it? You try to rotate it in the opposite direction and suddenly the ship starts to tumble. Your pitch is now constantly changing and your nose is moving up. ISS seems to move down. You might want to cancel these two but just for fun, you hit the third button. This alters your yaw. Now your ship's trajectory is a mess. The question therefore becomes, can you really dock it? Well, I can't really answer for you, can I? Here, try out the simulation and let me know if you succeed. P.S. I succeeded after the fifth try. Arkadeep Mukhopadhyay. Connect on LinkedIn. Mail me.